Hey, welcome back. Thanks for joining me again this evening. I'm Pastor Chad Palmer uh, with Mohican Church. And uh, we're going to be getting into the scripture tonight, uh, back into Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 is a text that, um, that we began a couple of weeks ago, uh, if you were with me then. And um, beginning in verse 21, uh, and, and right now we're going to be in 21 through 43 of Mark chapter 5. Before we dig into this, though, will you join me as we uh, go to the throne in prayer? Father God, we praise you this evening, uh, Lord, this day that you have made. Uh, let us rejoice and to be glad in it. Father, I praise you for your word, Lord, for the fact that it is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. God, it pierces to the very core of us and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. And so take it now, Lord, and do a work in me. I pray, Father, that, uh, that we would know you more as we get into your word. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters who are joining me here. God, I pray that your word would go out, that your church would be built up, that those who don't know you through the only way, which is Jesus Christ, would come to know you. God, we praise you for uh, your amazing grace toward us. And now, Lord, we just wait, wait on you as, uh, as we look to you in your word. And, um, God, we pray that you would just prepare us for, for tomorrow and for this week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, hey, uh, again, thank you uh, for joining me. We're going to be in Mark chapter 5. And, um, and the title of this, this message, uh, as I was thinking about this, is... When the Lord seems to be running late. Have you ever had one of those times when it just seemed like the Lord was running late? At least according to your timetable. You ever have an idea of how things ought to go? And when things should happen? When the Lord seems to be running late. I mean, after all, we are told in Scripture, various places, that we are to wait upon the Lord, right? Wait on the Lord. There are different texts, but Isaiah 40 31, which talks about those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up like on wings like eagles. You know, they'll walk and not grow weary, run and not faint. Wait on the Lord. Psalm 27 tells us various uh, different times at the end, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. We're also in 2 Peter 3, verses 11 through 14 is another place where we see that in those few verses... It is the, the waiting uh, on the Lord shows up at least three different times. That principle of waiting on Him, we have to wait on Him. And sometimes if we're not careful, when we see those references, those uh, commands for us to wait on the Lord, we can get the, the misunderstanding that He can be running late. Join me as I read Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet, and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, If I, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. 
While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weep, weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was twelve years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Praise the Lord for his word. Now, in that text, you might have realized, uh, recognized the, the first half of that as a text that we were in a couple of weeks ago. In that text, we focused on uh, the woman who Jesus met on the way. Uh, the woman who... The text tells us had an issue of blood, and she had that issue for 12 years, and nobody could figure it out, and, and Jesus stopped. In that interruption, he stopped and he ministered to that woman there. He met her there. He, he turned around and he looked her in the eyes, and he took time out to minister to her. We talked about ministry and the interruptions. But if you recall, the, what was he interrupted from? Well, he, we began this text seeing that he, he ran into this guy named, named Jairus. And the guy had a pretty important need. His daughter was at the point of death. And we see his faith in coming to Jesus. He said, I know that if you would just put your hands on her, she will be made well. And Jesus went with him. That's what they were doing. That's what they were doing when they were interrupted with this other need this woman. And so I just want you to, to, to put yourself in this position of the guy, Jairus, okay? I just want, to put, want you to go with me and put yourself in the man's shoes. The man who believed that Jesus could heal his daughter. And he made it, he got to him and Jesus actually said, yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming with you. Let's, let's go. Take care of your little girl. And Jairus and Jesus and, and, the, and the crowd, they're making their way. But they didn't get there. And so here's Jairus standing there. And Jesus is, is now, his attention has been turned away. And his attention is on something else. And listen, I don't know how long they waited there. I don't know how long that took for that interaction to happen. But still, that must have seemed like an eternity to a man whose little girl was, was at the point of death. Can you just see Jairus standing there in the background now maybe because he knows that he's got to wait on Jesus to get to his little girl. I can't help but ask myself the question, and, and maybe you need to ask yourself the question too, how are we at waiting? Listen, we have no reason to believe that Jairus was, was impatient. We have no, no recorded words to describe how he was in that moment. But I'm, I've, got to, I've got to think that he was a man just like me. How are we in the waiting on the Lord? Listen, Jairus was here when Jesus healed the woman. They were on the way to his daughter. And I can't help but ask myself this question. Was, was Jairus, if he had a watch, was Jairus looking at his watch? Was Jairus tapping his foot? Was Jairus thinking, maybe I could just, hey, Jesus, Jesus, can, 
Can we get moving here? I wonder what was happening in Jairus' heart and in his mind during this time. How was our brother doing waiting on the Lord in a time that was urgent? In a time that he was waiting on, on, on the Lord to do only what the Lord could do. But it seemed like they were burning valuable time there. Do you think Jairus was able to rejoice with those that rejoiced? You know, in Romans 12, 15, we are told um, it, part of our love for one another includes us rejoicing with those that rejoice and weeping with those that weep. Have you ever been in a really uh, a, a poor situation yourself, but, but somebody near to you um, is, is just had, a, had an amazing success in something? Perhaps it's something that you wish you had success in. But you're struggling. You're waiting. Nothing seems to be happening, and, and now this happens to them. And, and have, you ever, have you ever struggled rejoicing with those that rejoice? I just wonder. I just wonder if Jairus was able to rejoice when this woman got healed. When this, when this woman who interrupted the, the, the journey on the way to the little girl. I wonder if he was able to rejoice while they were having this conversation. Jesus and the woman, that is. While they were having this conversation, we see that, that Jairus gets word from his house. So while Jesus was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Your daughter is dead. Did he wonder? Perhaps. Lord, why did you take so long? Lord, if you would have just been there, if you would have just... Your daughter's dead. Don't bother the teacher any longer. Jesus, hearing this now, this news being relayed to Jairus, he, him hearing this, he looks at him and he says this, he said, don't fear, just believe. Don't fear, just believe. Now that wasn't some kind of mystical, just believe in anything, believe happy thoughts. Jairus came to Jesus, he was, he was drawn to Jesus in faith. That's how he came to Jesus. By the way, that's how we must come to Jesus. He came to Jesus in faith. Jairus at least had a little faith. Knowing that, that Jesus could do this thing that only God could do. And so he came to Jesus in faith. Little and frail it may have been. And Jesus looked at him now hearing this news that would have caused great heartache. And fear. And Jesus looked at him and says, Don't fear. I know all of the stuff that you're seeing from the outside, all of the stuff that's coming in and attacking you and bombarding you now. These words that your daughter is now dead. And I just want you to know, Jairus, don't fear. Only believe. Continue to trust me. Don't just believe in happy thoughts. But trust me, Jairus. Even if it was a little faith that he came to Jesus with, that faith was about to get a shot in the arm. That faith was about to grow. Jairus was about to get um, his, his theology of who Jesus was deepened. A more, a more uh, full understanding of who the Lord was. Something that I think that we need to be well aware of. When it comes to us and waiting on the Lord, waiting on Him for whatever uh, whatever thing it is, maybe it's a promise that we see in His Word. You know, maybe it is the promise of, uh, of, of Him coming again. Whatever it is, the, the promise that we are waiting on the Lord, we need to understand 
these, these couple things that would help us to wait. We need to realize the one that we are waiting for. One of the things we need to understand is that He is never late. He is never late. Because, see, late, late is, it is a word that means something has happened to mess up your plans. And God's plans cannot be messed up. See, late infers that something got in the way of the schedule, therefore things are going to be backed up a little bit. God cannot be late. He can't. That's one of the things that He can't do. He cannot fail. He cannot lie. He cannot do anything contrary to His character. And He cannot be late. That's one thing that we must realize when it comes to waiting on the Lord. See, see, we are forced to wait on Him, in a sense, because only He can do what He can do. And so we might think, why do we need the, the mandate in the Scripture to wait on the Lord? Because it, waiting... Biblical waiting is not just being forced to wait and sitting there uh, anxiously tapping our, our, our toes or, or gnawing on our fingernails. Biblical waiting is, is a peaceful thing. One of, the reason, one of the ways that we can do that is to understand who it is that we're waiting on. And, and, and the Lord, the Lord of glory cannot be late. And so while we're waiting, it's helpful to realize that that is part of his plan. Something hasn't gone off the rails. Kind of like when you're waiting for a friend. You're supposed to meet them at a certain time, wherever that is, and you're waiting on them, and, and all of a sudden they're not showing up when, when you expect them to show up. And, and all of a sudden you're starting to wonder what went wrong. When we are waiting on the Lord, we have to understand that He is never, ever late. He is always right on time. Time can't get the best of Him. You know, He can't be getting ready if He could get ready at all. He can't be getting ready and then all of a sudden say, Oh, shoot! Look at the time. i got to get out of here. I'm going to be late. That is not what the Lord does. He cannot do that. Time doesn't get the best of him. We have to understand that he is sovereign over time. He is not bound by time like you and I are bound by time. We were born in time. We will die in time. And, and in between those, we are in time. The Lord of glory is not bound by time. He is not captive to it. It, it does not affect him. Why? Because He created time. He is outside of time. He's sovereign over time. And time cannot get the best of Him. I want to read for you 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9. To give you this idea, this is Peter talking to the church and he is explaining to them, talking to them about the, the return of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord. And he says this, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Listen, do you see what Peter's saying there? He's saying, hey, beloved, look. Here's how it is with the Lord. One day is, is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. In essence, time does not affect the Lord. It's all the same to Him. He says the Lord is not slow. He is not slow. He is not late. Because, because some, uh, maybe you can relate to this. Because some believers, they hear the fact... Um, you know, the, the prophecy, the, the truth that the Lord is coming again. One of these days, the Lord is coming again. 
and 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 we have been rehearsing that and recounting that throughout generations and and he hasn't yet and so peter is encouraging them saying listen guys god is not late he's not late he is uh he hasn't fallen asleep he's not slack just because we're this far ahead and he has not returned yet doesn't mean that he's not going to because with him a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day he's not slow he's not slow as a matter of fact his delay is for a purpose his delay is for a purpose another great thing about the Lord is that he is not because he's not affected by time he's not limited to work only in one place at a time as much as I have tried, I can only be in one place at a time. Not so with our God. Not so with our God. He, he, he can be working here. He can be working in Africa. He can be working uh, down in Antarctica. He can be, you name it, at the same place. He's not bound by time. He's not limited to, to work in one place at a time. And listen to this. God's timing in our life. It's not dependent on a full schedule. Because if you think you're busy, you know, it, can we imagine how many things God is doing, the one who holds all things together? Our waiting on Him does not, it is not at the mercy of a full schedule. You know, like a wait time, have you ever made a phone call and you're, you're on hold and you, you, you know, you've got the, you've got the phone in your hand and, and uh, you're listening to some music and then all of a sudden an automated voice comes on the phone and says, your call is important to us. Your expected wait time is 45 minutes. Have you ever had that happen? Why do we have to wait? Why do we have to wait on the help that we need that's on the other end? Because of the busy schedule. They can only do so many things at once. I just had a call uh, the other day that I, I mean, I hung up promptly, but it did say 45 minutes. That's how long I had to wait, not because that was by their design, but it's because they were so busy. God is not like that. Instead, listen, the, our waiting upon Him is calculated and purposeful. If we are waiting upon Him, it is for good reason. It is for very good reasons, by God's design, because He's sovereign over all time. You know, there's a, there are reasons why we have, um, we have to wait for certain things. We've been doing some canning uh, lately, and, um, and so for, for various foods, you have to have that, the, the jars in the canner for different amounts of time. You know, for green beans, it's one time, you know, it's a, it's a certain amount of time for meat, it's a certain, it's a, a longer time for, for fruit. It's, it's a much less time. We have to wait those, those periods of time for a very specific reason so that that food will be rightly preserved. So it is with God's timetable. So it is with, with why we have to wait on Him. It's because it is a very purposeful and calculated reason that we are waiting on the Lord to do whatever it is that we are counting on Him to do. His timing in this case with Jairus, this wasn't because he had a, an interruption. This wasn't because he had a busy schedule. This interruption in Jairus, in, in their journey, this encounter with Jairus and, and his pausing on the road, this is going to serve to increase Jairus' faith. We see this different places in the scripture. As a matter of fact, in John 11, uh, John chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, you might remember that text as, uh, as being Lazarus and his sisters. And, and Lazarus was sick. Jesus got word of it. And this is in verse yeah, 5 and 6. It says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea. And, and so, listen to that. Jesus, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, 
and he was going to die. Jesus waited. He didn't just go. He didn't pick up and run. When he heard, he waited two days longer. On purpose. Intentionally. Why? Because all of our waiting on the Lord is purposeful. All of our waiting on the Lord has been calculated by Most High God. Who, by the way, loves us like crazy. And so all of our waiting, we have to understand, is, is intentional by the Lord. You know, in this journey here, as, as, the, as Jesus and Jairus were on the way, and, and they stopped, and the woman was there, you, you know that Jesus could have said, Hey, I'll be right back. Hey, I'll be right back. We got to get, we got to get. He could have told his disciples, hey, get her name, I'll, I'll, I'll contact her later. He could have done that, but he didn't do that for a very important purpose. So he is sovereign over time. He's not bound by it. But not only that, he's sovereign over things that are affected by time, things that deteriorate, things that, that die. Death itself. Listen, in Mark chapter 5, actually even before that, into, into chapter 4, we see that Jesus had just demonstrated that He is sovereign over nature. When He was in the boat with the disciples, that's in the end of Mark chapter 4, he was, he, He's sovereign over that because He got up and He said, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He demonstrated He was sovereign over nature the wind and the waves. He, was, he demonstrated that he was sovereign over demons in the beginning of Mark chapter 5 when he spoke and, and legion, the demons had to come out of the man. They had to obey his voice. He's sovereign over demons, over the spiritual realm. We see then that he's sovereign over physical sickness. We see that even in the, the account where the woman touched his garment. He's sovereign over that. And now, in this account, we see, and Jairus learns, that Jesus is sovereign over death itself. Essentially, what happens here is that he gets to the little girl, and, and she is, in fact, uh, she has, in fact, dead, uh, died. She is dead. And he gets in there, he says, Little girl, I say to you, arise. I say to you, arise. In the words that Jesus spoke, have authority just like the words that he spoke at the beginning of creation. Because Jesus was at creation. He actually, nothing was made except that he made it, we're told in the scripture. And so the words, even that formed everything, told this little girl again to arise. And life came back into her. And immediately she got up and started walking. Jairus is coming to understand here that there is no realm over which Christ does not rule. And, and, and had he come to know that as quickly, if Jesus would have gotten there earlier, I submit to you that he wouldn't. Which was one of the reasons why Jesus delayed, perhaps. There is no realm over which Christ does not rule. So even as Jairus, perhaps, we, I think, need to get a fresh perspective in our waiting upon the Lord. How do you think Jairus was able to respond next time he had to wait? How do you think he might have responded? How do you think it might have been easier for him? Next time he found himself in a position of needing to wait on the Lord. Do you think there was the nervousness in him, like like the, the, the tapping of the foot, the looking at his watch, the... the the gnawing on his fingernails. Do you think there was that the next time? I would venture to guess no. Why? Why is that? Because I really do believe that he had a clearer perspective of the one on whom he was waiting because of this interaction with Jesus, because of this happening with his little girl. He had a clearer perspective of who it was that he was waiting for. 
the one who was sovereign over time, the one who was sovereign over even death in the grave. A couple of quotes from A.W. Tozer I just wanted to share with you. He said, If we are not aware of what kind of God our God is, or what He is like, we simply cannot have faith. Faith does not come because we do not know the character of God. Tozer saying, we need to know the Lord and who He is and His character if we are to trust in Him. And if we do not know who He is, how can we possibly trust Him? He also said this, if I do not know what He has done, how can I really have faith in what He will do for me today? If I don't know what He is capable of, if I don't know what He has done in the past, how will I really be able to trust what he is what I need from him today do you know who you're waiting for by the way let me just throw this in there just because you pray for something or just because you you want something to happen doesn't mean that God is going to do it and so you're waiting for him to show up and so we can assume that he's on the way with that answer now, because sometimes, you know, when we pray and we ask Him for things, He says something like this, No, I'm not going to do it. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. That's what He told the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. However, we do know that there are a lot of things that the Lord will do that only He can do and that He's promised us in the Scripture. There are things that we will pray for that, that line up with His will that He wants to do. He wants to answer. Sometimes it is yes right now. Sometimes it is hang on. Hang on. And so we need to understand remembering who he is, remembering his character, remembering what he is able to do. That will make it much easier for us to do what we are called to do in waiting on him just like we see in Psalm 46.10. In Psalm 46.10, many of you might be able to quote this uh, just right off the top of your head. Psalm 46.10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Listen, that gives us a glimpse into biblical waiting on the Lord. That is not waiting and being a, an emotional, um, anxious mess. But that is having a right understanding of who God is and being able to be still or to cease striving is what it actually means cease striving stop be at peace cease striving and know that I'm God in essence he's saying this don't panic remember the Lord's character and remember his sovereignty over everything. Be still, cease striving, and know that I am God. Know His character and know that He is sovereign over every single thing. There's nowhere in, in, in all of creation, nowhere where God is not sovereign. He is sovereign over time. He is sovereign over every circumstance. We can trust Him as we wait, as we wait upon the Lord. And we can do so in peace, not striving, because we remember who He is. The Lord is never late. Father, we praise You for that truth in Your Scripture. We, we, uh, we thank You for this glimpse into, the, into this account, Lord, with Jairus and with his daughter, and with Jesus. Father, I, I praise you for, uh, for what we can glean from the Word. Lord, as we are here in this time, God, whatever it is we're waiting on, Lord, uh, to, to, for you to do this work in us, for you to do this work in a relationship or in somebody that we're praying for or our, our society, God, whatever it is, help us, Lord, to wait on you well. To trust in you to do what only you can do and to do it in the perfect timing 
I thank you, Lord, that as we're waiting, there is nothing that can happen, no amount of time that can pass, Lord, that will affect what you are going to do, nor is there anything that can happen in that period of time that is going to hinder you. Help us to wait, and help us to wait well. Help us to see striving, and to remember that you are God. We praise you, Lord. Help us to look to you, uh, calm our anxious, uh, calm our anxious hearts. Still the the wind of the waves in us, and help us to trust you more. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. Thank you for uh, for joining me today. I pray that you just continue to get into His Word. Um, His Word again. It's living and active. Um, it is relevant for life. It speaks. Uh, it, it speaks. He speaks through it. Uh, so I pray that uh, I pray that your appetite would be uh, would be wetted for the Word, and that you would find yourself getting into it early and often. All right. Hey, I love you guys. Till next time. I'll catch you later. Love you.